morning, church. Good Let's worship the Lord. You know there's power in his name. Amen. Let's do this.
that I enjoyed when I was a kid and it's kind of had a resurgence in popularity and that is uh, collecting baseball cards when I was a kid I collected a lot of baseball cards and uh, it's really caught on again and you might be surprised to hear what some sports cards are worth uh, I don't know if you follow basketball but the uh, NBA champions right now are the Milwaukee Bucks and uh, does anybody know who the uh, MVP on the Milwaukee Bucks is no 
Giannis, and we can't pronounce his last name, Antetokounmpo, something like that, and I didn't get it right. But his, his basketball card is worth $1.8 million. His basketball card is worth $1.8 million. This is not it, so don't worry, okay? <laughs> How about a, a, a recent Super Bowl winning team, not, not the Buccaneers, um, but prior to the Buccaneers, he plays for the Kansas City Chiefs. He's the quarterback. Does anybody know who that is? Quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs? Pat Mahomes. Pat Mahomes, his football card's not worth as much as uh, Giannis. His football card is only worth $861,000. Not even worth keeping, right? Okay. One of the uh, better baseball players in the major leagues today is Mike Trout. His baseball, one of his baseball cards is worth $3.9 million. But the most, one of the most expensive cards belongs to a player who hasn't played in many years. In fact, he's since passed away. Mickey Mantle's first baseball card is worth $5.2 million. So if you have cards laying around at home, you might want to go through them and see if they're worth anything. And you might think, who in the world would pay a million dollars or $5 million for a sports card? Well, I've, there are obviously people who think it's worth it because you pay for something. If you think it's worth it, you'll pay for it, right? If you think it's worth it, you'll pay for it. And we need to remember that in the eyes of God, we are worth very much because of what God paid for us. Now, God didn't pay for you with millions of dollars. He could have. He could have used millions of dollars to redeem us and save us from our sin, but he didn't do that. What he gave to save us, what he used to redeem us, was the costliest thing that could ever be given. It was Jesus Christ, his one and only son. And Peter reminds us of this in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. See, gold and silver, they're valuable here on earth, but even baseball cards and football cards might be valuable here on earth. Our homes, our cars, these things might be valuable here on earth, but they really have no value in eternity. So God gave of the most valuable thing that he could give. Jesus Christ gave his life and his blood to save us. And we are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. So as we partake of communion, if you want to take a moment to uh, open up the uh, communion cup, the bread and the cup, we'll partake in just a moment and remember the precious blood and the precious life that Jesus gave for us when he died on the cross. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we can be here today. Thank you that we were able to worship and sing. Thank you that we were able to sing about the power in the blood of Jesus. And it's that powerful blood that he poured out for us, that saves us, that forgives us. And Lord, we uh, thank you that we are redeemed, not with silver or gold, but we were redeemed with that precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. We know and we believe that Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as we partake, we partake in his name. Amen. Let's take the bread and the cup and remember Jesus who gave everything for us. offering it's it's kind of the reverse <coughs> worship of communion it's kind of the opposite response in communion we remember how much God has given for us and in offering we take a moment to consider how much are we giving back to God and we give back to God with money that we put into the offering but we also give back to God in other ways by serving other people by loving our neighbor by sharing the good news with people who need to hear about Jesus Christ and uh, please remember to give to uh, IDES.org. You can go to their website and send a gift directly to Haiti to meet the needs of the people down there. 
And uh, let's not forget it. I mean, it might not be on the news cycle as much as it was, but there are still great needs down there. So uh, we encourage you to keep giving to AIDS.org. We also heard from our missionaries in uh, Haiti, and they're doing okay. So pray for his seed sowers, pray for AIDS, and uh, go beyond the, the power of prayer and give and make a difference in what's going on down in Haiti. And we want to say thank you, as always, for your generous giving. We have a very generous church, school supplies, backpacks, Thanksgiving meals, money. There's so many things that our people give. So we want to say thank you for your generous giving. We really appreciate it. And those who are blessed by your giving, they appreciate it as well. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we are here today. And we thank you that you have given so much to us. We are blessed in many different ways. And Lord, when you bless us with money and finances and employment, we want to give back to you what you deserve. And Lord, help us to remember that we don't give to expect a blessing. We give because we have already received those blessings. And Lord, we thank you that you are the Father who gives us every good and perfect gift. And we just want to return the gifts back to you that you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, I would encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 9, 19, excuse me. Turn to Luke 19, you can turn there or pull it up, because we'll be taking a look at the life of Zacchaeus today. Zacchaeus is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, and uh, there are 10 verses that talk about his story. And it's interesting to me, because the story of Zacchaeus, we kind of think of it as a kid's story. We think of the story of Zacchaeus as a kid's story. You know, there's songs about Zacchaeus, and there's cartoons about Zacchaeus, and some of you are singing that Zacchaeus song in your head right now, and other, others of you are thinking, Mark, please don't sing a song in front of church, okay, and I'm not going to do that. But I think the reason why we have turned Zacchaeus into a kid's story is because he was short, and kids can relate to short, um, and some adults too, uh, including myself. He ran, he ran to meet Jesus, and he climbed a tree. So these are all things that would appeal to a kid, but there's a lot of great truth in the story of Zacchaeus for adults. So we're just going to take our time and go through Luke 19, verses 1 through 10, and look at the story of Zacchaeus, how his life was changed when he came in contact with Jesus. So we're going to enter into that story, Luke 19, verses 1 and 2, to begin with, as uh, Jesus and Zacchaeus meet for the first time. Luke 19, 1 and 2, talking about Jesus, he entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector, and was rich. Now, Jesus entered Jericho, and hopefully one thing you've learned about Jesus as you have studied the Gospel of John, as you've studied the Bible and the Gospels in your life, is that Jesus never did anything by accident. He always had these divine appointments. When he went through Samaria in John chapter 4, he went there for one purpose, to meet the Samaritan woman at the well. That's the way Jesus operated. Things just didn't happen by accident. They were all divine appointments. So when Jesus goes to Jericho, he's going there for one reason. He's going there to meet Zacchaeus. When Jesus goes to Jericho, he wants to meet Zacchaeus. And the name Zacchaeus means pure and innocent. Now, when we hear that his name means pure and innocent and that he's also a tax collector, it kind of seems like an oxymoron, right? There's no such thing as a pure and innocent tax collector. And we all know what an oxymoron is, right? It's two words that go together, and, uh, but they're, they're opposites. You know, a pure, innocent tax collector just doesn't sound right. Some of you like to eat jumbo shrimp, right? <laughs> How can it be jumbo and a shrimp at all at the same time? Some people say they're taking a working vacation. You know, work and vacation are opposite things. Microsoft works, you know, that could be a, an oxymoron to some people. The one that I like, uh, the one that I see often is when I go to the store and it says speedy checkout. To me, that's an oxymoron, okay? So some people will consider a pure innocent tax collector an oxymoron. But not only was Zacchaeus a tax collector, he was rich and he was a chief tax collector which means he's sitting on top of the pyramid. The other tax collectors answer to him. He's the one in charge. He's the boss. And uh, they were treated very poorly. A tax collector would have been treated very poorly in Jesus' day. Jewish people wouldn't have liked him because he was considered a sellout to the Roman Empire. 
And here's a quote from R.C. Foster. R.C. Foster was one of the great theologians, one of the great teachers of the life of Christ. R.C. Foster said this about tax collectors. He said, tax collectors were regarded as having forfeited their birthright as sons of Abraham. That's what he wrote. That was the mentality, that if you were a tax collector, if you were a Jewish boy who was a tax collector for the Roman Empire, you were no longer, you gave up on your Jewish heritage. You forfeited your rights, your birthright as a son of Abraham. So when the people looked at Zacchaeus, they saw a rich man who was a sellout and a sinner in their eyes. Verse 3. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because, of, because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Now in Luke 18, Jesus was in Jericho as well. Luke 18 and 19, both chapters tell us about Jesus in Jericho. And in the previous chapter, Luke 18, Jesus healed a blind man named Bartimaeus. So after this healing of the blind man, all of these people want to see Jesus. They all want to be around him. They want to be near him. And Zacchaeus is just like the rest. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. He had this unquenchable desire to see Jesus. He's a tax collector. He's short. But the crowd didn't stop him. He was willing to climb up into this sycamore tree because he wanted to see Jesus pass that way. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. There are still many people who are seeking Jesus today. I mean, as Christians, we continue to seek Jesus, but there are people who still seek to know him and understand him and believe in him. And that's where Zacchaeus was. He was seeking to meet Jesus and get to know him for the very first time. And God makes a promise throughout the scriptures that if you're willing to seek God, God says, if you're willing to seek him, you'll find him. In Jeremiah 29, 13, the Lord says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. He's small of stature, but he doesn't let the crowd stop him. He doesn't let anything stop him. He runs ahead, climbs a tree because he wants to see who Jesus was. And the Bible says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And that's the kind of seeking that Zacchaeus was doing here in Luke 19, because Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus. Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus but what Zacchaeus did not realize was that Jesus was seeking him. Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus, but Jesus was seeking him as well. And he could not see over the crowd. Verse 5, John 19, 5. Here's Jesus. He sees Zacchaeus. What does he say? And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And uh, that's basically how the song about Zacchaeus ends, right? The story doesn't end there. The song ends there. But Jesus saw him. There was only really one person who saw Zacchaeus that day. Who was the one person who saw Zacchaeus in the tree? Jesus. Jesus. Everybody else ignored him, overlooked him, but Jesus saw him. And that's the way Jesus is. Read through the Gospels. You'll notice that Jesus finds the person who is hurt or who needs healing. The person who needs a miracle, the person who needs teaching, the person who needs forgiveness. Jesus always sees those people. He doesn't miss people who are in need of his saving power. Jesus saw him. He looked up to him and said, Zacchaeus, called him by name. He looked up to him and called him by name. He called him by his name, Zacchaeus. Jesus saw him. Now, I would imagine that Jesus stopped at that tree. I think Jesus stopped. I think he saw him and stopped. And when Jesus focuses on Zacchaeus and ignores the crowd, to me, that's Jesus himself forgetting about the 99 and focusing on the one. He leaves the 99. He, he, he's not giving them his attention. He's focusing on this one man in the tree, Zacchaeus. So Jesus stopped. And when he calls him by his name, Zacchaeus, he is validating his worth. Zacchaeus, you are important in the eyes of God. I like this quote that says, Jesus never got so busy trying to save everyone that he didn't stop to help someone. Jesus never got so busy trying to save everyone that he didn't stop to help someone. I know that we can live busy lives. I know that there are people who, in our church and in our community who are busy, but there was no one as busy as Jesus. And Jesus always stopped for people who were in need. 
you know what? I'm guilty of not always stopping. You know, there were times in the past when I'd be talking to somebody at church and, and they'd be talking to me and I'd be talking to them and I'd just kind of keep walking. You know, I just kind of keep walking. And, and I felt bad about that because what I'm saying, they might not realize this, but I realize this, is that if I'm talking to you and I keep walking, I'm saying that I don't value your, uh, your conversation right now. And if I'm not valuing your conversation, I'm not valuing you either. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped and called him by name and said, Zacchaeus. Called him by name and called him Zacchaeus. When Jesus looks at Zacchaeus, he doesn't see a position. He doesn't see a tax collector. He sees a person. He sees Zacchaeus. Jesus knows his name. No introduction is needed. God knows your name. God knows my name. Jesus knew the name of Zacchaeus. God knows the name of every person who has faith in him. And God knows the name of every person who still needs to believe in him. God knows us by name. One of the great verses of the Old Testament is Isaiah 43.1. Isaiah 43.1, God reminds us of this truth. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. God says, fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Now, when I hear that verse now, it makes me think of uh, the first episode in season one of The Chosen. Because in the first episode of season one of The Chosen, there's a lady named Lilith. And as she was growing up, her father <coughs> quoted this verse to her. She memorized this verse. She carried this verse with her. And she would recite it when she felt like she needed God. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. But Lilith becomes demon-possessed, and she would drink alcohol to try to stop the demons from tormenting her. And one, in one scene in The Chosen, she's sitting there getting ready to take a drink. A drink is placed in front of her, and as soon as the drink is placed there, a hand covers her hand to prevent her from taking the drink. The hand is the hand of Jesus, and Jesus says, that's not for you. Lilith starts to walk away. She doesn't want any part of Jesus. The demons don't want any part of Jesus. But then Jesus does something that stops her in her tracks. He calls her by name, Mary, Mary of Magdala, because Lilith is really Mary Magdalene. No one knew her real name except Jesus. The drink crashes to the ground. Mary is stunned and she says, how do you know my name? And Jesus says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. It's a powerful reminder that God knows who we are. He knows where we are. He knows what we need. And he knows our name. When Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and calls him by name, he says, I see you, Zacchaeus, not as the crowd sees you. I don't see you for the man you are, but I see you for the man you can become. And it's interesting in verse 5, it says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Now, there's a word in there that shocked me, surprised me, in John 19, not John 19, Luke 19, 5, where Jesus says, hurry, because Jesus is not one to hurry. God is not one to hurry. And I was thinking about this. Why does Jesus tell Zacchaeus to hurry? Well, Zacchaeus... If he had said, you know what, there's a lot of people gathering around Jesus today, I'll come back another time. The problem is there's not going to be a next time. Because if you read through the rest of Luke 19, you will find out in verse 11 that Jesus is near Jerusalem. And in verse 28, it's Palm Sunday, which means it's the beginning of the final week of Jesus Christ. Zacchaeus won't have another chance. This is his only chance to see Jesus. So Jesus says, hurry and come down. And let's move on to Luke 19, verses 6 and 7. Luke 19, verses 6 and 7. Luke 19, 6 says, So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. 
he's only days away from the cross. He won't be back through, Jer through Jericho again. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must go to your house today. So Zacchaeus is excited that Jesus is coming to his house. I mean, everybody in that crowd wanted Jesus to come to their house, right? You know, if Jesus showed up today at our church, that would be, that would be pretty cool. And um, if Jesus said to you, hey, I'm coming to your house, you'd be excited. But then I think you would take a step back and say, man, the kitchen sink is full of dishes. <laughs> right. The dogs haven't had a bath in two weeks. And the kids exploded all over the living room. And I've just described what my house looks like right now. So if you feel bad, come on over and help us clean. Anyway. But everybody was, ex well, Zacchaeus was excited. It says Zacchaeus hurried down, hurried and came down and received him joyfully. But not everyone was joyful for Zacchaeus. Hey, good job, Zacchaeus. Jesus is coming to your house. Not everyone was joyful. Verse 7 says, And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And I always think it's curious. It's interesting that they would say this. Because everybody in that crowd had one thing in common. What was it? They're all sinners. No matter who he picks, he's going to be in the house of a sinner. So maybe they're a little prideful. Maybe they're a little jealous. But public perception never bothered Jesus. Public perception never bothered Jesus. He goes to the well to talk to the Samaritan woman. He lets the sinful woman anoint his feet. He calls Matthew from the tax collector's booth. Public perception never stopped Jesus. It never bothered Jesus. Jesus was often criticized for the people he hung out with. When we think of Luke chapter 15, we think of Jesus telling the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the prodigal son. But all that started for one reason, because this is what people were saying about Jesus in Luke 15, verse 2, where it says, But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's why Jesus told the parable of the lost son and the lost sheep and the lost coin, because they were complaining about the crowds that Jesus was hanging out with. So when they say, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them, when they say that about Jesus, Jesus considers that a compliment. Because Jesus would say, those are the people who need me. It's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. So Jesus saw these people having a sickness that he could only heal, that he could only save them. So Jesus was willing to hang out with the kind of people that we usually don't hang out with. Right? This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus not only hung out with those people, he was willing to go to the cross for those people they thought it was a put down to call Jesus a friend of sinners but Jesus welcomed sinners that would be a good thing for people to say about our church you know that church they welcome sinners because that's the only way we can save people is if we lead them to Jesus Luke 19 verse 8 and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Now, to me, there's a little joke in there. Zacchaeus stood. Remember, he's short. He couldn't see over the crowd because he's short. So to say Zacchaeus stood is interesting because you might not be able to tell if he's sitting or standing because he was so short. You know, some people are tall and some people are not. You know, it's okay. We, uh, we served at a church in Lake County, Adventure Christian Church, and we had a lot of tall guys in that church. I mean, we had many guys who were six foot six and taller. But our tallest guy was Barry Booth. Barry Booth was, is six foot ten. And Barry, Barry would talk to me a lot on Sunday mornings. In fact, there was one year at the church when Barry was being ordained to be a deacon in the church. And I was being ordained as an elder. Now, I felt like, you know, I wasn't old enough to be an elder. I don't think I had gray hair at that time. Maybe I did. I've got plenty now. But I remember they ordained us, and they asked us to kneel down on the stage. And I think Barry got down on his knees first, and he was still taller than me. <laughs> so that's okay. Zacchaeus was short, but he stood there. And do you notice what he calls Jesus in verse 8? He calls him Lord. He calls him Lord. Behold! Lord, so he's showing repentance. 
Remember, his name means pure and innocent. He's starting to live up to that name. Because Jesus saw him not for who he is, but for who he could become. He's starting to live up to that name. He's living up to that name that means pure and innocent. He confesses Jesus than maybe we have ever done before. Because he says, right now, half of my goods I give to the poor, right? Half of my goods I give to the poor, gone. Half of his portfolio is gone. If he had two chariots, now he's down to one. If he had 20 pairs of sandals, now he's down to 10. Cloaks, camels, whatever he had, it's gone. Could you do this today? That would mean if you have two cars in your driveway now, guess what you have by the end of the day? One. That's what Zacchaeus did. If you have shirts or shoes, whatever you have more than one of, you give half of it to the poor. We're actually told to do this in Luke chapter 3, verse 11. In Luke chapter 3, verse 11, John the Baptist said, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. That's what Zacchaeus did. Half of what I have, I give away right now. Look, Lord, behold, right now, right here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. If you have two of something and they have zero, you, we need to share with those people. If we have two and they have zero, God expects us to share with them. And then Zacchaeus says, if I have defrauded anyone out of anything, I restore it fourfold. Fourfold. Now, in the Old Testament... In Numbers 5-7, there was actually a rule about making restitution. Numbers 5-7 comes from the law of Moses, and it said if you, if you cheated somebody, or if you stole something from somebody, if you robbed them, you had to make full restitution and add a fifth. So that means you add 20%. So in the Old Testament, if you had cheated somebody out of $100, you have to add a, make full restitution, so you pay them back $100 and a fifth, $120. That's what it means. You steal $100 from somebody, you make full restitution and add a fifth, $120. Zacchaeus says, no, 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 no. That's not good enough. He says, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, if I've cheated you out of $100, I will pay back fourfold. How much is that? $400. Now remember, he's doing this after he's given away half of his possessions to the poor. So he gives half to the poor, and then he says, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back fourfold. So what does Jesus say about all this? Luke 19, verses 9 and 10. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Zacchaeus called Jesus Lord and demonstrated repentance. And Jesus says that Zacchaeus is saved. Today, salvation has come to this house. Today, salvation has come to Zacchaeus. I was very stunned one time when we talked about this story in a Sunday school class. And I had an older and wise gentleman who said that in his mind, Zacchaeus was trying to buy his way into the kingdom. You can't do that. You might be able to fool us, but you can't fool Jesus Jesus was the one who said, today salvation has come to this house. Jesus saw his heart. This was the man who was running and climbing trees and calling Jesus Lord and giving half to the poor and repaying back four times the amount. Jesus saw his heart. Jesus didn't want to leave one person in their sin, including Zacchaeus. Jesus came to remove sin and shame and replace the sin and shame with grace. And that's what he's doing for Zacchaeus and just like Zacchaeus in that tree Jesus knows where you are today just like Zacchaeus in that tree Jesus knows where you are today and Jesus will meet you right where you are Amen. but he can't leave you there he'll meet you where you are but he won't leave you there did you notice in verse 9, not only did Jesus say, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. You know, the people thought Zacchaeus had forfeited his rights as a child of Abraham. Jesus says, No, no. He's a child of Abraham. He's a son of Abraham. And in verse 10, Jesus tells us what his mission in this world is. 
For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Whenever you see Jesus use the phrase Son of Man, he's talking about himself. Remember Muhammad Ali liked to call himself the greatest? The greatest of all time. Well, Jesus uses the phrase Son of Man to refer to himself. He came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't come to teach and heal, even though those things were very important. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And now he wants his church to continue to do that, to seek and to save lost people, people like Zacchaeus. We are called to seek and to save lost people. And just to refresh our memory, how do we do that? How do we seek and save lost people? Well, in order to do that, it begins with us. We have to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We love our neighbor as ourselves. That's called the Great Commandment. And then we obey the Great Commission that Jesus also gave us. Go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us. We love the Lord. We love our neighbor. We go make disciples. We baptize them. And we teach them the teachings of Jesus. That's how we seek and save lost people. We do it the way Jesus did. But it's interesting that Jesus calls him a son of Abraham. That's not part of the song about Zacchaeus, is it? I guess that means we're supposed to write a second verse for Zacchaeus. And include all this, include the second half of the story. But when you hear that he's a son of Abraham, doesn't that remind you of another song that maybe we sang when we were younger? We might sing it at Vacation Bible School or church camp. Father Abraham. Remember that song? Yeah, Father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them and so are you. And we might think, we're not really sons of Abraham. We're not descendants of Abraham. We're not his children. But we talked in Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29, and it's exactly what Zacchaeus was experiencing that day. <coughs> In Galatians 3.26, it says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. We are children of God by our faith in Jesus Christ. Zacchaeus came to faith in Jesus Christ that day. Verse 27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We're no longer clothed with sin. We're no longer clothed with, you know, the sins that we've committed. We're clothed with Christ. We've put on Christ. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's no division, we're united because of who Jesus is. And then in verse 29, it says, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. See, Jesus looked at Zacchaeus and said, you are a child of Abraham. And this verse says, this passage in Galatians 3 says that because of your faith and baptism in Jesus Christ, guess what you are too? You are a child of Abraham. God told Abraham, I will give you descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And you're one of those stars, you're one of those grains of sand because you are a child of God and you are a child of Abraham. The people would have told Zacchaeus, and other tax collectors. You have forfeited your birthright as a child of Abraham. But when Jesus looks at Zacchaeus, he says, Zacchaeus, you're not forfeited. You're not forgotten. You're not forsaken. You know what you are? You're forgiven. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. And we would love it. God would love it. All of heaven would rejoice for salvation to come to your house and for salvation to come to you. The reason we sing is because God is so good and because God is great. We're going to sing an invitation song, and if there's anybody here like Zacchaeus who needs to respond to Jesus, this is the opportunity to do that. In Galatians 3, we are told that because of faith, we are children of God, and when we're baptized in Jesus' name, we have put on Christ. So the song that we're going to sing is all about God's greatness and goodness. It's called Great Are You, Lord. And if you need to respond today, God's grace is waiting for you. God's love is ready for you. We encourage you to step forward and make that decision as we stand and sing this song together. Thank you. 
God, we thank you that we can be here today. We thank you that you are great. And uh, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And thank you that all of those things were demonstrated towards Zacchaeus. And Lord, we thank you that you've demonstrated your love, mercy, and grace to each and every one of us. Lord, help us to remember that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. Lord, we thank you that you are seeking after us, and we thank you for saving us. And we pray for those who are still, uh, still waiting, still praying, still thinking. And uh, we pray that soon they will also realize that you're the one who came to save them. We thank you for your love. We pray in Jesus' name. That's like six million. It's pretty expensive. Yeah, and uh, Ty Cobb and all those, yeah. like the, the original greats. The, yeah. the Wagners. Um, the Wagners. I have a stack of football in front of my dog in the 60s. I got Lyle Alzado. And some of the other two ones? Yeah, I, would, I think he's worth yeah. like three hundred bucks. It's not huge, but three hundred bucks is a 